Now, the question arises whether this is just a coincidence or is it something behind it. This is of course part of the universe, the physical universe we are talking about. Then we talk about the life. There are millions of life forms in this universe. Some of them you can see here, but you have marine life, you have birds, you have animals, you have reptiles, you have insects. And of course, we have the great human being. Now human being if, is the most evolved form of life. If you look at human life, it's a miracle. I don't think there's any, anything which can compare to the human body. I'm talking about the body alone. This is the only machine in the world, in this universe, which can create inanimate food into animate body parts. What we eat is the bread and the butter and juice and water and it converts into blood and flesh and bone inside our body. Each particle of the human body is intelligent. It tells us you are thirsty, you need water, it tells us that you are thirsty. If it needs energy, it tells you that you are hungry. It makes you feel hungry. When it needs rest, it makes you feel sleepy. Each particle of the human body is absolutely uh, par excellence and intelligence which you can't imagine. There are thousands and thousands of examples one can give on this. I'll come back to the theory of evolution later on. But human being is a great creator because we are the second most evolved form of life after the creator. And therefore we are a great creator. We have created what not. We have created submarines and the aircrafts and we have created digital world today. We have created uh, the missiles and we have created uh, autumn bombs as Ashok was talking just now. So, and we will keep creating because we are, we have this, uh, 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 what you call, uh, heritage of creation that is inside us. Now, I will go to the, this part later on. Now, first the question arises, in order to understand the creation, how do we understand the creation of this world? I think there are some fundamental principles to understand the creation. There are some principles which I want to spell out now. The first fundamental creation principle of creation is that as the things become more and more powerful, they become more and more subtle. They become more and more subtle as they become powerful. I will give you two or three examples to explain this. One is that food is very important for us to eat. We cannot survive without food. But food is gross, you can touch it, you can see it. But people can survive without food for one month, even two months, 60 days. Water is less gross than food. How many days can we survive without water? Maybe five days, maybe one week. Water is not as gross as food, it's more subtle. And what about the air? How many minutes can we survive without air? It has become more subtle. You see, as it becomes subtle, it becomes more powerful. Let me give you another example of the human body itself. I was talking about the human body just now. The body is a miraculous machine created in this universe. But remember, this body is the weakest part of the human constitution. I call it human constitution, not body. Weakest, remember, weakest part of the human constitution. This huge big body which is a miraculous machine, which converts inanimate into animate and which gives you inanimate hair from the animate body. Eh? When a mother gives birth to a child, automatically the, uh, the milk comes in the breast. You see that kind of intelligent body. But this body is controlled by five senses of perception and five senses of action which are much smaller than the body. Imagine a body, a human being who cannot see with his eyes properly, who cannot hear properly, who cannot eat properly or taste properly. What is his body? It's like a vegetable. So the big gross body is controlled by the small senses. But senses are the second weakest part of the human constitution. As they become more subtle, senses are controlled by what? Senses are
are controlled by mind, man. Mind, if you are sitting here, your ears are here, your senses are here, but you will not hear me unless your mind is with me. It is the mind which hears, it is the mind which sees, it is the mind which smells, it is the mind which tastes. And where does mind exist? It doesn't exist. It becomes more and more subtle. It goes beyond the power of sense perception. The mind becomes so thin, it is so thin that you can't even feel where it is. You don't even know where it is. While it is so powerful that mind is mind which controls you all the time. Even beyond mind, there's intellect, because mind is a very volatile instrument. I'm not talking on that today, but the, the intellect, each, the, even, even finer part of the mind, another part of the mind, and it tries to control the mind. It tells you this is legal, this is illegal, this is ethical, this is unethical, this is moral, this is immoral, this you should do, this you should not do. Keep telling the mind all the time. And where does intellect exist? Can you tell me? Can you see the intellect? Can we see the mind? Can we touch the mind? So as the things become more and more powerful, they become more and more subtle. And then the next thing happens is that they go beyond sense perception. Your sense organs are not able to perceive those finer aspects of that existence. So we rely on sense organs in the modern science. Modern science is all based on observation. You must go to a laboratory, you must observe the space, you must taste things. How do you observe and test and experiment with mind? Tell me. And mind is not the last ultimate. There are many layers of the human constitution. I will come back to that a little later. So the modern science has limitations because they cannot reach that subtle part of their existence at all. It's not possible for them the way they conduct themselves today. That is why they always depend on these senses. The modern science depends on these five senses. All perception, all experimentations, all observations, all studies are based on these sense perceptions. While these senses are totally, firstly they are incapable, secondly they are undeniable. For example, you see sense, even the sense of sight. You see from the aircraft, the city, it will look very smart. If you come down, it looks very different. In the day it looks different, in the night it looks different. Yeah? And when there is a fog all around, you can't even see the city. So where is the sense perception? How does it you know, help you? Sense perception is an unreliable instrument and that's why the modern science fails in understanding the mysteries of the universe. When there is a dark, nothing can be seen. Darkness, you can't even analyze anything you see. Without light, nothing can be perceived, nothing can be studied, nothing can be understood. So this is, in fact, I, I always tell that the modern science can't even tell you till today whether the egg was born first or the chicken was born first. A man was born first or a woman was born first. How can you unravel the mysteries of science through modern science? So you have to go to a higher science, a science which is much higher than the modern science, which understands the meaning of the subtle existence and that is what we are talking now. Now I want to give you Example, two examples of the, I call them insensible. As the, as the existence becomes more and more subtle, it goes beyond perception of senses, beyond the grasp of senses, and therefore I call them insensible. They cannot be perceived by sense organs. Take the example of time. Time controls all your life every day. Every single moment is controlled by time. If I say I am 57 years old, that means that is time. If I have to come here at 6 o'clock, or somebody has a meeting at 5 o'clock, somebody is a child, somebody is an adult, all that is refers to time. There is nothing but time. You grow helplessly with time. A fetus grows helplessly with time. We grow helplessly with time. We become young, we become old, then we die helplessly with time. Can we control? Not only we, even this table is governed by time. Even this microphone is governed by time. The entire existence is governed by the vagaries of time. 
why we do not know where time exists. Can we see time? Can we catch time? Can we hear time? Do we know where it exists? We don't. And you know, sir, no, no existence time governs this entire existence. This is the power of insensible. This is the power of the subtle existence, which uh, some of the ancient Indian writings bring out very clearly. Let's talk about the space. Now, the space, you see, the modern science can't define the space. They only say between this wall and this wall, what exists is the space. What exists between moon and sun is the space. But they can't define the space because it has no attributes. This open space has no attributes at all. It's called uh, nirgun in, in Sanskrit. It's called without any attributes. Now, a thing which has no attributes, how can you define it? You cannot. And that's why science cannot define this space. And you know what is this space? This space is the most powerful part of entire universe, of entire existence. And I will give you examples to tell you how it is. This vast space where you see nothing, nothing is there, but everything which you can imagine is there. Everything. To begin with, the air we breath is here. That's why we are breathing in and breathing out. Otherwise, we cannot. All the sounds we speak in any form are all in this space. All the sounds. You put million headphones here, all of them will receive their separate sounds. You put thousand computers with internet, connect, wireless connectivity, they will get all their data and information out. Because this all exists in this space. Still your remote control will work with all that. If you want to open the curtain with remote control, it will still open. The sun rays come into this space and leave all this energy. This cosmic energy is there in this space, which we breathe in ultimately, and which constitutes the pranic energy in our body. The entire water cycle, how the water cycle works, the water rises from seas, from oceans, even when you dry your clothes, it rises, it goes into this space and forms cloud. You look at the miracle. If you have to carry 10, 10 liters of water from here to that gate, you have to make so much effort. The nature lifts trillions of tons of water every second from the ocean surface, from lakes, from wherever it is, transports it in the form of clouds, thousands of kilometers, and then the condensation process takes place and you have rains, refilling your lakes, your rivers, your glaciers, whatever it is. So this is the power of this empty space. Not only this, you have a hundred story building. It goes on flames, for example, for some reason. What happens? It just disappears into the space. Whereas only a small little pile of uh, ash will go on the ground, everything else disappears into space. Huh? This is the power of space. We consume trillions of liters of petrol every day in this, on this earth. Every day. Where does it disappear? It disappears into this space. So everything which exists in this universal physical form comes from this space and goes back into this space. I don't want to go into detail because that will take a little time, but it also comes from the space. That is a very important point. So I want to give you one example. You have this crop, you know, in the field you cultivate crops. On the same field for 100 years you cultivate millions of tons of crop and fodder. The soil doesn't deteriorate, it remains as it is. Where does this millions of tons come from? Where does it come from? The science says photosynthesis, they say air and uh, the sunlight makes the photosynthesis with the soil. But where does this weight come from? Where does this whole creation come from? This comes from this empty space. The millions of tons of jungle, the woods, the timber, the, the, the food we produce, it comes from the empty space because all these exist there. This I will come a little later. Now, this was the third element of the mystery of life. The first is that as the things become more powerful, they become subtle. Secondly, they become insensible. And thirdly, the insensible parts are very, very powerful. Now, there's another mystery, another I would say key to the mystery is that 
for any creation you must have consciousness without consciousness you can create nothing can this stone create anything can this microphone create anything can this table create anything it is impossible can this iron create anything it's impossible to create anything without consciousness consciousness is the most important ingredient of the creation like here there is a consciousness this is man who can create for example he takes the wood and he can create a gate he can create a window he can create a beautiful uh, architecture out of because there is a consciousness we are conscious people we can create animals are less conscious therefore their creation is small plants are even less therefore they cannot create much so as the consciousness rises the creation takes place and the human being being the most evolved person is able to create the maximum that's how it is beyond of course the, this the creator who is who creates everything else so this is very important that without consciousness nothing can be created the theory of uh, big bang says that the cold scoop of energy just exploded by accident at some time and then uh, it expanded into the universe and these you know solar systems and planets and all these were formed and they started behaving on their own can you believe is it possible it is not possible it's scientifically not possible at all because nothing which no has consciousness cannot create anything you need consciousness to create for example this man now he was creating everything but the moment the consciousness goes out of his body he is dead he can't even sustain his body his body is it cannot be sustained even for a few hours that's what happens when the consciousness leaves the body so without consciousness so this is little bit you know i made it in the last moment but the existence become more and more powerful it becomes more and more subtle let me also give you an example of the sleep can you see sleep how it comes when it comes your so called powerful body becomes helpless you know you can't do anything you just collapse when the sleep comes what happens this is the power of insensible this is the power of subtle this is the even in computer exam we take a example of computer for example the computer hardware we see this we can touch it it is gross we can see it but this is not powerful what is needed is software now can you see the software where is the software nobody can see that software you can see the cd rom but not the software itself even in the modern technology this is how it is the more powerful things are insensible so let us talk little bit about the creation now we have seen variety of things in the creation one is the physical nature the other one is the consciousness the consciousness which gives rise to variety of uh, you know living creatures starting from insects to the human being and we have the physical nature now in the vedic writings it has been very clearly explained not in one place but in thousands of places how the creation takes place of the nature and how the creation takes place of the conscious beings in this world the creation of nature takes place starting from the space space is the holding place for everything without space nothing can exist this earth cannot exist without the space no sun can exist without the space so first space has to be created to create anything else so the first element of the creation is the space we they call it akash antriksh in sanskrit it is not exactly space but you can say space in the modern language space has you see this i would like to highlight that all parts of the creation physical creation have direct relation with human body which i want to explain now the space is directly connected to the sense of hearing all the sounds originate there shabda is the attribute of space this is the only attribute of space and it is connected to the uh, to the sense of hearing of human beings 
The second part of the creation is the air. It, it is the second creation after the space. Air has two qualities. The first quality is the quality of sound which it inherits from the space. And the second is the quality of touch. So there are two qualities in the air. The quality of touch gives us the sense of touch. It is directly connected to the quality of touch of the air, the sense of touch we have. Then the third creation is the creation of fire. Fire, you can call it energy in the modern terms, but the sun is the visible symbol of fire. Sun is not fire. Sun is like a piece of wood which burns with fire and gives you light. Once the, the wood is finished, the fire extinguishes, but fire still exists in unseen form. It doesn't get destroyed. So the fire is the source of energy. The fire has three qualities. The first quality of sound which takes from the space. Second quality of touch, you can touch. And the third quality is the quality of sight. And the eyes, our human sight comes directly from third quality, that is the fire. As soon as the sun goes down, you cannot see. When the light goes down, you cannot see. The fourth creation is the creation of water. The water has been created after the fire and the water has the quality of taste in addition to the three other qualities which it generates from the predecessors that is sound, touch and sight and the taste, all the tastes which we have they originate into water and our sense of taste is connected directly to water and the last creation is the creation of earth the earth is the most solid form. It, you also see the theory of creation. It starts from the subtle, most subtle and then becomes grows and grows and grows and most grows. The most grows is the earth which has the smell. It is the attribute of smell of its own. Plus it also has all the four other attributes which it inherits from the other elements of the creation. That is the space, sound from space, touch from air, Aside from water, aside from fire, and taste from water. Therefore, earth has all the five attributes which we have. And this is connected to our sense of spirit directly. That's why the, it is not accidental that we have five fingers here. It is not accidental that we have five fingers in our toes. There is a reason behind it. This creation is a very scientific system. There are five elements in the nature which I told you space, air, fire, water and earth and there are five senses in the human body of action, five senses of perception. They are, come from there and that's why we have five fingers in our hand and five fingers in our toes. Similarly, there is also five variety of prana but I won't go into that right now. So, this, the creation is a very scientific uh, job. It has been done by a great scientific mind. Now, if you think this has been done accidentally and it has happened accidentally, and I think I am not prepared to believe it because it cannot be proved. Anything which what I am saying is, I am not able to prove it physically, but you can prove it in your own self. You think about it and you will find that there is what I am saying makes sense. So that is the higher science. The science which you understand through your own introspection, through your own analysis inside your mind and intellect. That is the science which we are talking about. That is the science which Vedic writers talk about. And that is the science which is promoted through yoga, promoted through meditation. <laughs> These are of course uh, the various layers of the human body. Now I want to talk a little bit about the consciousness now since uh, sometimes people say that consciousness doesn't really exist, it comes from the chemical biological creation as some people, some scientists say. So I want to explain that a little bit to our daily life. Each one of us pass through various stages of consciousness every single day but we do not realize it or we do not recognize it. 
This is one state of consciousness which is called waking state. In this state we are conscious, we can see, we can touch, we can hear and we are connected with the physical world directly. Physical world. We are physical, we feel our physical body, we are connected with the physical world. That is the called waking state of consciousness. Now after a little while you will all go home, you will take your dinner and you will sleep. And in the sleep, you will dream. This world will be destroyed, you see. This world will not exist. You will create a new world in your dreams, in which you will be a player and you will play a role like you are playing here. But you will play that role in Tejas form. In Sanskrit, it's called Tejas. Tejas means like sunlight. You are playing that role like light. You exist in the form of light. You don't exist in the physical form. With physical form you are sleeping. Your senses are sleeping. But all your, there are 19 gates of the human body which are used for perception. All the 19 gates work when we are in awake state of awakening right now. They also work in the state of dream sleep but in the form of light. In the dream sleep you see, you hear, you taste, you eat, you argue. You apply your mind, you walk, you talk, you do everything what you do here. But that is a very different state of existence that is called Tejas and a state of light. So we exist in the form of light there. And then you have a deep sleep after that. All the dreams appear, the dream world is finished, everything is gone, you are sleeping. You don't know what it is, you don't even know the bed where you are. You are practically dead. None of your senses are working. Even the, uh, the light form has disappeared. What happens then? What is that consciousness? You are dead practically. But when you get up, you say, I had a great sleep. Who tells you that you had a great sleep? There is somebody inside us which tells you that you had a great sleep. So, that is called the pure state of consciousness. That is the purest state of human consciousness. You may call it soul or consciousness, whatever name, it doesn't matter. But the fact is that we have this consciousness in us. And when we die, this consciousness leaves us and we become a core. We are not a human being that time. I will not be Gauri Shankar, I will be a core. It will be a dead body. So it is the consciousness which makes me Gauri Shankar. It is the consciousness which makes Pavel as Pavel. So this is the state of consciousness which we pass through every day but we do not recognize. We do not understand it. So now I want to explain how the final creation takes place. In Sanskrit they call it the very two very famous word Prakriti and Purush. There are two things which constitute the entire universe. That is called Prakriti and Purush. Consciousness and the physical nature. I gave you the example earlier that a man can, from this wood, he can create a gate or he can create a window or he can create this furniture. Because there is a combination of the two. The consciousness of the man, because of consciousness he can think, he can apply his mind. And the physical nature provides him the equipment, the instrument, the, like we create aircraft. How we create an aircraft? Our consciousness, our mind works. And then we have the lot of minerals and you know, uh, metals and other things in the, in the nature which we use to create an aircraft. So every creation has the combination of the consciousness and the physical nature. Without that, no creation can happen. If you give me an example, I will be happy. Or anybody can give me an example. This is the fundamental mystery of the creation. That the consciousness and the nature, they create the entire universe. Even if you look at human creation, all human creation starts from nothing and then gets into the physical sense. 
like human creation we think i will create this table what is this thought it doesn't exist how do you understand that it is in non existent form just in the form of a thought but that thought brings you to the table then you gather the wood you gather the skill you bring the carpenter and you create it if you want to create an aircraft the same process works if you want to create a dress the same process works if you want to create this microphone same process works so every creation starts from zero and then culminates into the actual physical existence so this is not that difficult to understand the creation isn't it is it you see within a very short span of time we have covered Uh, briefly how the creation works and how we are created now one more point which i would like to mention is that the consciousness has a variety of degrees it increases in vedic writings the consciousness also has five degrees we call it mineral regime the mineral regime also has consciousness but it is so low that it is not visible but it has consciousness because it decays with time with time it will deteriorate the, the chemical composition will change and it will disappear or disintegrate but it is very very low the second regime is called plant regime which has slightly higher level of consciousness but it cannot talk it cannot walk but you can see the tree grow giving you a fruit but it is it cannot create much more because the level of consciousness is limited the third level of consciousness is the animal regime where it is even higher than the plant regime they can create certain things animals birds they can create things they are much more uh, you know they talk among themselves they walk they uh, listen they they they, they are more visibly conscious but not as much as we are ours is the fourth level of consciousness human consciousness which is most developed form of life and then the fifth is the universal consciousness which is the consciousness which pervades this entire universe without that this universe cannot exist so this is how the level of consciousness changes as it goes higher up it becomes more creative it becomes more powerful it becomes more important and as soon as the consciousness goes out of any existence that existence is destroyed so now look at the human body's creation because we are the most uh, visible form of consciousness and most developed form of creation when the conception takes place how the conception takes place it takes place with a drop of semen that is how it concepts it takes place where does semen come from it is made out of the food we eat the food we eat converts into seven uh, minerals into the body seven dhatus as they call in ayurveda the last part is this human semen it is called sukra essence so the sukra is the reproductive part of the uh, of the human body which comes from the food we eat so the food is the physical part it comes from the physical universe so this this is the physical element of the creation which comes into the human being then there is a consciousness which enters at the time of conception without consciousness this semen cannot create anything it's not possible to have conception conception takes place only when the consciousness enters the semen at the time of conception and then the conception takes place then the fetus is formed and then the body grows and that's how the creation of the human being takes place and when that consciousness leaves us we are dead we are gone we go back to those five elements of which we are created we are we have all the five elements in our body our body is made of those five elements our senses are made of those five elements we go back to those five elements so this is how the creation has been explained in ancient indian and greek writings the modern science is not able to understand it because they cannot understand and experiment and observe the existence of the subtle and the insensible
they must understand that in order to understand the intricacies of uh, of the mysteries of this universe and our existence thank you very much speaking on the environment now because I think I have covered a lot on this but environment is very interesting subject as well but maybe some time else. Your Excellencies, uh, dear guests, let me thank you on behalf of our institute uh, for uh, giving this uh, talk and uh, all of you for being present here on this sunny day and it is time for discussion, so uh, we'll be all happy if you pose the questions regarding either the subject of uh, creation or also the environment development. actually emanation so yeah, yeah you know sometimes when uh, you just use the word creation in the uh, uh, western uh, jargon and in the context of western culture uh, the, the real background of Indian thought may not be perfectly grasped so uh, it's uh, just adding one important information for us Westerners uh, to your uh, thrilling lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yaroslav. Just to ex expand this little bit, you see in, in the Vedic writing, the creator is called Brahman. Hmm? That is the name of the creator, Brahman. And this word comes Briha. Briha is the root, Sanskrit root of this word Briha. Briha means to expand, expand infinitely. In fact, it has been told that the Brahma expands in the form of this universe and that's how he creates. It's a very beautiful example that uh, Makadi is called, a spider creates a net around it and then gulps it back. The same way the Brahma creates this uh, Srasti or this universe around it himself and then he takes it back. And there's a very you know, detailed scientific explanation how it happens. In fact, the Bhagavad Puran gives very fascinating writing on this, how it happens. But thank you very much for this addition. But let me also conclude with one Sanskrit sloka since uh, we started the Sanskrit sloka and that explains the entire creation. Poon madhaya, poon midam, poonat, poon mudachyate, poonashya, poon madhaya, poon mevavashishya. I think the professor knows the meaning, but this is what explains the entire creation uh, or entire srasti as we call it. Uh, your Excellency, thank you very much for your uh, perfect explain and for your talk. And please, I have uh, one question. What is it? Love. Love, love. You see, the love has been explained very beautifully in Indian uh, writings, in, in Vedic writings. Once, there is one more property when I was talking about that when the things become subtle. One property of when things become subtle, they also become uniform. Like the table is here, it is static, okay, in one place, you cannot be expanded. But air is more uniform, spread all over, and the space is more uniform. Similarly, the universal consciousness, which is far more subtle than the space, is 
is spread all over. So once you start realizing that you are a consciousness, you are not a body, once you realize that, you will find that everybody is a consciousness. Everybody has that consciousness in him. And there is no difference between me and him. So you treat others like you treat yourself. That is the best love you can do to anybody. And that is how the love is defined in the Indian writings. That you do not treat anybody else the way you do not want to be treated for yourself. Because you are the same consciousness, part and particle of the same consciousness which creates everybody else. So that is how I would like to define it. So if we may also afford a question, how do you see the possibility of artificial intelligence? Uh, the fact that humans could uh, create something which would surpass them uh, in a way, how would that fit into, how would such a possibility fit into the, uh, the concept of creation and the growth of consciousness? As I told, the human beings are creator, we can create certain things, but we can never create consciousness. We can only create, uh, we can create a computer. Computer is also some, some form of intelligence, because it can do ideas and subtraction on its own. So that creation is possible, but you cannot create consciousness. You can create physical things. You can create physical uh, things using the material available in the nature. Apply your mind, apply your consciousness and create. But you can never create consciousness. That is not possible. Your Excellency, thank you very much for your thorough, thorough presentation and particularly for writing uh, this book and for your research. Uh, my question is also related a little bit to your profession because you are a diplomat and you follow also, of course, uh, deeply in the international relations. And I would like to ask uh, how you would place in context or in what mutual explanation you would place your, you know, the content of your book or your, the results of your research and like the global political situation in the world today, which is of course also full of tension. So how it is correlated those two, two aspects? Thank you. I think this, this book, I must tell you firstly that this book has nothing to do with Religion, nothing to do with philosophy, it is purely science. As I am explaining you, this is a higher science, science of the subtle existence. And there is one final, very important uh, aspect of human life is what, who are we and why are we, what are we living for? What are we living for? If you ask ourselves. This, one single answer you will find at the end is that everybody wants happiness. You may accumulate wealth, but ultimate objective is happiness. If you want to become powerful, you want to think that power will make you happy. So whatever you are doing, if, even if I want to become a professor, I feel that I will, it will give me happiness. I want to write this book, I think it will give me happiness. So happiness is the character of human being. And why? This character is very important. You see, there is a word in Sanskrit called Satchitanand. Now, this word describes the character of, not fully but partially, the character of the Creator, the Brahman, the universal consciousness. Sat means which is existent without any change. It is eternal. It doesn't change. It is beyond the vagaries of time. Time doesn't affect it. Hmm? That is one important thing. Things which are affected by time, they are called asat. All this is asat including my body. This table, everything is asat, which deteriorates with time. Things which do not deteriorate, they are called sat. Consciousness is the only one which is not deteriorate with time and therefore is called sat. Chit is chetna, that is the consciousness. It gives you life. The consciousness inside you gives the life to the whole body. When the food goes inside the body, why it becomes life? Why it becomes intelligent? Because this consciousness gives you life. 
So that is the second word. Anand is the third word that means happiness. This is the third character of the human consciousness or the universal consciousness. Sat, that is, it is eternal, immortal, unalterable. Chit, that it is, keeps you conscious, it keeps you alive. And Anand, that it is always wanting happiness, always wants happiness. That's why we always want happiness. You show me one single person who doesn't want happiness in this, in this universe. We want happiness. But this is the, uh, what you call character of our existence. This is the character of our soul. And therefore, if we can understand that, I think we can resolve a lot of conflicts around the world. There are a lot of conflicts around the world because of this question of happiness. We are looking for happiness into physical objects. You know, people want to control energy resources, they want to control uh, mineral resources, they want to control water resources, because they feel that is needed for the happiness of their country, for the growth of their country, for the, uh, you know, for their people. Now, that is not is going to give happiness. That is a temporary transient happiness, which is subject to depreciation and decay, and finally, it becomes unhappiness. If I buy a nice cell phone today, I feel I'm very happy with it. Tomorrow my friend buys a better one and now he has a better one, I feel I'm happy. You see, these happinesses come in transient. This is not happiness. Happiness will come in Once we start understanding that, I think these conflicts in the world will reduce. They will not disappear, but they will reduce. That's why we must understand, or we must educate who we are and what is the purpose of life. Why we are born? What happens to human life? So these are the questions which I have uh, addressed in the second part of the book, which is individual, uh, micro book in fact. The first is the macro, the second part is the micro, which addresses the actual human problems of this world. Thank you. <coughs> I just wanted to address the three questions which have come, which is firstly the one about love. I think the problem which much of the world faces today is the confusion between the word love and the word lust. So the problem is that love itself is a very expanding term. It is an inclusive term, it is not a divisive term. And that is the message which is trying to be passed on by all religions. And uh, this is the reason, because you confuse between love and lust, that you are uh, not able to distinguish the importance of love and what, uh, what role it plays in uh, our lives and in the world itself. And uh, as far as artificial intelligence, you know that uh, in our philosophy we say, Aham Brahmasmi, I am the creator, I am God. So there is this concept that you are not different from God, you are God himself. You are God, I am God, we are all God. And the distinction that is occurring is because we are unable to see the illusion that we live in. All this is illusion. And when we can move beyond the illusion, then we will reach God. I mean, we will realize that we are God. So that is one of the problems why I think you will never get artificial intelligence. We are reaching the same level. Because if you realize enough to be able to realize yourself, then you would not be here, if you know what I mean. And uh, finally, to address Madam uh, Polsansa's question, uh, the question of uh, chaos is something which is a very important uh, thing. You know, the whole process in uh, our spiritual feelings is that you go through cycles. So it's not that you're starting somewhere at the Big Bang and you end at the end of the world and that there is nothing before and nothing after. Everything is a cycle. So that is why even life and his days goes through the cycles. You have the yogas, you have the four yogas, and when the four yogas are over, there will be a dissolution, a complete uh, disappearance of the world as we know it. But it is not a disappearance in totality because consciousness still remains and it will come back as a new age. So this is the cyclic thing. And when, when things are good, then of course things will move ahead. When they become really bad, as predicted by Lord Vishnu himself, creation itself will change. Thank you. So I believe if there are no more questions, I would close the official part of today's evening. I believe you all enjoyed it.
So I thank you very much again for coming. I believe you enjoyed the evening. You learned a lot of new and interesting issues and ideas. And uh, I will close the official part of the meeting. And you all are welcome to small refreshment. We have some waters and good check wine for some informal discussions. And if you are not in the line. Learned about everything that can we talk in the book. With Who Am I is one of my favorite chapter. With the page two of seven, I recommend it. So I believe we have a couple of uh, prints here. If you are interested in that, or in Consciousness exists and the life in the form of light exists. So what happens after death is that it's very simple. You see, at the time of death, there is a prana called udan prana. The five pranas are not going into that side today. But five pranas in the body. The udan prana takes your soul out of the body. It goes away with the uh, what you call the balance of your karma and mind. Your senses, mind and karma, they go with this. It goes exactly the way like the, uh, the air, you know, air takes the fragrance of the flower, isn't it? There's a flower here, the air takes the fragrance and goes away. Same way the Udhan Prana takes this away from the body and goes away. And then it remains in variety of form. There are various, you know, Writings how it goes, there are two paths called uh, Krishna and uh, Sukla and or Devyan or Pitriyan path and how it happens and what happens after that, how it takes birth. This has all been explained, but I won't be able to explain that right now given the shortage of time, but this happens. Depending on the karma, you get good or bad life afterwards, how you are born, because good is not cruel, you see. Why somebody is born as a crippled person or somebody is born as handicapped? Other person is born as absolutely in good health. One person is born in a palace, another person is born in a, on the roadside. Why? Is God cruel? Why should he do this? He is not cruel. This happens because of the karma. Because what you did, you have to reap the harvest. It is the Newton's uh, principle that every action has opposite and proportional reactions. Same thing applies to the theory of karma. There's a chapter in the book on theory of karma which explains this. Thank you.